Now, if you've been listening for the last couple of weeks, the messages I've been taking you through the Old Testament, pointing to the work of Christ, the cross, the blood, the finished work, from the prophetic imagery of Genesis 22, the offering of Isaac, and the very careful Hebrew, which I did not get into, in the mount it shall be seen, pointing to a prophetic future time, to the book of Exodus and the Lord's Passover, which when he said this will be something to be celebrated or observed from for generations, forever, well, that could only mean that the Lord's Passover would, be, would become what it was in its reality, but would become complete in Christ. We looked at Leviticus 16 and the Day of Atonement, pointing to the work of Christ, specifically looking at the blood. And if time were allowed, and if I could just keep going and I could make this into a, a series ongoing on we could stay in the Old Testament and I could take you through books like Numbers with the reference to the brazen serpent, pointing again once more to Christ, and Christ himself references this. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he shall draw all men unto himself. Every single book has within its pages in the Old Testament references to, they are shadows, they are types, they are prophetic direction, looking to Christ and his work. This is why I said at the very beginning, three, four messages ago, one cannot separate the two and say, oh, I only want to look at the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, we see the heart of God being, we'll call it, painted in black and white. The New Testament gives us the color, but through both books, even though I said black and white, the blood runs through it all, and the work of Christ is ever-present. I could have spent time in Leviticus, apart from Leviticus 16, looking at the sacrifices and the offerings, which most point you to the work of Christ in some dimension, in some capacity. I think that probably of all the books of the Old Testament, uh, putting aside this altar where we were, I believe, last week, um, no Old Testament book looks at the work of Christ in such great detail, prophetically told, than the book of Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 53, but the servant songs themselves, which there are several, really, it's impossible for anyone who has read the New Testament to look at these passages specifically out of Isaiah 53 and not see who else could be fulfilling this except that it be Christ. And I said the mystery of all this is that we've got thousands of years of writers, some writing with incredible prophetic vision, others writing without the prophetic vision but giving us a shadow in which Christ would fulfill. If I looked at Deut Deuteronomy, is in fact so impossible if we were looking at shadows and types and prophecies even there that we would spend probably many weeks just in the Old Testament alone. But I decided that I would definitely jump from the Old into the new, even though I'd like to spend time in, in Isaiah 53, I will not do it today because I remember that there, there are enough messages that have been delivered um, about Isaiah 53, mostly uh, on healing, but there are many in-depth teachings through that book that point to Christ and the work of Christ and the finished work of Christ that I felt it's better to leave that alone because if this place is a series, they can weave those teachings on Isaiah 53 in to make the series complete or more complete. So 
we're going to go into the New Testament today. And I thought that it would be good at first, see you can change your mind about things. I thought it would be good at first to look at the chronological order, possibly putting Mark first in analyzing the death, resurrection, and finished work of Christ. But I said, no, we're just going to stay with the order in which the books are, in which they unfold in our Bible. So I'm going to take you to Matthew. That was a long way of saying, I'm taking you to Matthew. Please turn to Matthew. <laughs> now, here is kind of an interesting thing. It is important when anyone does an analysis of the New Testament to put things in proper order. You will hear me say the Gospels and I must qualify. I don't want to be using terms that a lot of people get hung up on, like synoptic or not. So I'm going to say that I put Matthew, Mark, and John together referring to those as the Gospels because these are eyewitnesses. We know that Mark is actually writing for Peter. It should have been Peter's Gospel, but it's not. It's Mark writing for Peter. We know that. Matthew is the tax collector, and John is the beloved disciple who also later writes the Apocalypse, the book of Re Revelation. I put Luke in a separate category because he clearly says that he set out to put all things straight, to lay out and record the history, and we know that Luke traveled with Paul, so the likelihood that Luke was an eyewitness to these events is greatly reduced. In other words, he had to go around and get a lot of eyewitnesses or people who were there to tell their account. And this is why the material, the writing style, obviously because Luke is writing as a Greek author and very polished, very fine writing. But Luke's focus tends to be more on the compassion of Christ. He's not as um, taken with some of the things that, for example, Matthew, Mark, and John will be. Now, people have argued that there is a common source, a common book of sayings, perhaps, that was recorded. I don't really like going into that argument, and I'll tell you why. I have a problem with this. And the problem is that if we rely on what's commonly called Q or common sayings, and no one has seen this book of common sayings, but if we were to hypothesize that it exists, it does something really terrible to the intent of each writer. And I'll tell you what it is. Let's go to a secular mindset for a minute. An accident, a car accident occurs. A group of eyewitnesses is right there at the corner where it happened. There's a woman across the street who is walking her dog. There are people who are a half mile away and heard the noise and turned. Each individual will give her a police report telling about what they saw, but we have to get the mindset that for the woman walking her dog, she knew what time it was. I'm, these are all, I'm making this up to paint a picture for the Gospels. She knew what time it was because she was home walking her dog. That's her lunch hour, which is between 12 and 1. That time happens every day, so she could accurately say, the accident happened between 12 and 1 while I was walking my dog. That was her focus, was the time, because she knows she has to be back at work. Maybe she saw the color of the car, and maybe she saw the driver. But her details may get ambiguous. And I've got a couple of police in here who know what I'm saying is true. You've got the group of people who were on the corner. They were busy talking about what they're going to do later on. They don't really know what time it was, unlike that woman. And maybe only one of the three or four people in that group was looking in the direction of the accident, actually saw it. The others heard. They're still eyewitnesses, but they heard they didn't see. And then you've got the people that are a half mile down the street that heard the impact. Maybe they ran towards the scene and they took note of the fact 
that it was a red car and a Caucasian driver. I'm making all this up. But each person may have a different way of remembering that it doesn't necessarily, if you put it all together, it tells the big picture. There may be a few details that are left out even there. Why? Because no one was looking to see how the accident would unfold because no one knew it was going to happen. Unlike the Gospels, where they had abundant warning by Christ, he said, for this cause I came. And the beginning of each Gospel writer specifically, now I'm bringing back in Luke for a minute, but specifically Matthew and Luke's concern to present the genealogical information was not Mark's concern. There is no genealogy there. In fact, Mark's gospel is very straight to the point. It lacks a lot of the teaching that Matthew included. And many of the miracles and parables recorded in Luke are nowhere else, which means Luke had to go and find people that heard or saw things that the disciples either didn't hear or see or omitted as they told the story. This is what makes all of this, when we start investigating, so compelling. If, if they were all saying the same thing, we'd say, this is collusion of the greatest kind, a conspiracy of the worst kind. So when we look at this information, it's important to not just say, yes, common source material, and try and somehow reduce it down to something we can wrap our minds around. Yes, there were common sayings of Jesus, and they all basically, like a pot, they reached in and they took out of the common sayings. I almost kind of would I'd analogize it to this. Those of you who said you've been around for 30 years, if you were around and listened to Dr. Gene Scott for 30 years, there are certain things that he said that if you hear somebody else say them, you right away go, come on, that's Gene Scott. How many times has that happened? A lot. Concretionize, <laughs> right? Fathers. I hadn't heard anybody ever say that. I think he, I, he may have made the word up. I don't know. But there's many of those. So something so unique to him, you would say it's unmistakable. Does that make that a Q document? It makes it GQ. Uh, <laughs> that's what he used to say about himself. But it makes it unique to him that then begins to be repeated and spread around. So putting the Gospels in the camp of we must reduce it down to a pot of common sayings, what, where it does damage is those who were giving color for the sake of. And I will say it like this. John is recording from the eternal perspective. Matthew has a message which I feel is an extension to Jew and Gentile to try and remedy, if you will, regarding the suffering servant, regarding the Messiah. How, and I'll justify this in something I'm going to say, how if Jews began to follow Christ because there was no Christianity until Jesus died and rose and they begin to be called those who were in the way before they were called Christians at Antioch, there had to be an understanding of what would happen to Judaism through those who followed Christ. And I believe Matthew lays it out in such a way that if you had Matthews, Matthew has more teaching of Christ, more words of Christ. Um, a lot of Old Testament um, scriptures that are being quoted along with the life of Christ, giving a more complete, if you will, description of the life of Christ. And you could take, you could pick up and go to the book of Acts and then Romans. You'd be able to make sense of the events. If you only had Mark, you might stumble a little bit because Mark not only doesn't give a genealogy if you were a Jew looking for, that was important to them, you wouldn't get it there. And if you take the shorter ending of Mark, which ends with them running away from the tomb, and by our translation, they were scared and running away 
and eh, I don't know what that would leave you with, except something happened. They were freaked out and they were running, right? Doesn't say too much. So it's important to keep all of these, as I said, kind of in their own right and look at them as witnesses or eyewitnesses who are conveying a message. What is interesting about Matthew's gospel is you have from the beginning an idea that sense of doom, the sense of something regarding this child, and we'll call it a, a bloodline. I'm not speaking of the bloodline, royal bloodline, but as the death of Christ, really from the beginning. From the time that we read about Herod recognizing the wise men are coming to see the child that was born supposedly king of his people, and he is the, the ruling king, when he gives the decree to wipe out the children, right away there we encounter the subject of death and the spilling of blood, even though it is by a corrupt leader, which is, goes straight through Matthew's gospel. So it's kind of interesting that you have this kind of information, and I am convinced, the people that, who listen to me, whether you're a Christian or not, this is something that I, I still just think one has to think about this. Of the hundreds, if not thousands, of Roman crucifixions that took place in the time of Christ, why is it, perhaps we may know the names of one or two individuals, but by and large, most of the people who died they are dead, and we don't know them. They are nameless. They are people we, we don't know who they are. Why is it that the death, and now I'm not speaking initially of the death and resurrection, but the death of Christ, why is it that this one Jew crucified at that time, that his death has remained not just some incredible mystery to some, fabrication and fantasy story to others, but it has been repeated generation after generation after generation. And when you think about it, thousands of deaths committed by Roman crucifixion and only one man's name that keeps being repeated, whether you are a devout follower or absolutely convinced that he was not the Messiah. This is a remarkable thing. Just that on its own is a mystery. All people talk about Death. Why is it this man's death? Matthew will weave in. And this is a very important part of his work. He's trying to unfold the telling of Christ's life and work. But Matthew seems to record the life and also the fulfillment of Scripture in ways that others may or may not do. And I'll give you a perfect case in point. In Matthew 21, if you'd like to turn there. In Matthew 21, beginning at verse 33. Now this is a parable that is included in Mark and Luke. But the reason that Matthew includes it is not just because it was a common saying. There's, you, you keep digging and there's much more to this than at first meets the eye. Let me read this, starting at verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, built a tower, let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. Now we know in this parable, the vineyard is Israel. And the owner is God. We've got some interesting people that will be called here. It says, and when the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants, the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. The husbandmen took his servants, beat one, killed another, 
stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. These are all the messengers, the prophets of God through the centuries. Why? Because when you keep reading, it says, but the last of all, he sent unto them his son, and saying, they will reverence my son. This is Jesus. And Jesus is telling the parable. Matthew is recording it. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir, come let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. The point of this parable, that later Christ will say elsewhere, the sins of your ancestors is, are upon you, and, and that sin is still within you, essentially saying, now God still sent another mouthpiece, and you'll do the same thing. Reject. So it's quite interesting that just in this one instance, there's something very deep. Even though I said Mark and Luke record the same parable, what is interesting in Matthew's writing as you begin to analyze it is Matthew seems to be interested about the relationship between Jew and non-Jew, both in continuity and in, we'll call it, discontinuity, disconnection, um, how will this play out? But specifically, he's interested in recording the state of the people, how they would approach his own people, how they would approach the subject of the way. We're speaking about the death of Christ. So this is an interesting perspective in Matthew's writing. Secondly, when we, we begin to look at Matthew's writing, and look at how many times he writes, and this was written that thus and so should be fulfilled. He starts in Matthew 122, chapter 1 and verse 22, and you'll find those references. Take a look, I'll, let's just so you can see the example. But he does it repeatedly. Now all this was done, that's Matthew 122, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. So it's important for Matthew to put in the, what I call, the references of as it is written. His concern is to show Christ's fulfillment of certain prophetic scriptures. The interesting thing is equally what he omits, not just what he includes. And if time would permit, I could go into a lot of the strange things that he omits that to me are glaring, like why wasn't this included? For example, if you remember in the eighth, I believe it's in the eighth chapter, it is in the eighth chapter, when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of fever, he touched her hand and the fever left her. And he says in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. What's remarkable is that this is perhaps one of the scant references to Isaiah within Matthew's writing and in the passion portion of Matthew's writing, which begins at chapter 26, there's not a reference. That's really remarkable. The fact that it was omitted either says that Matthew unequivocally and those of his day unequivocally saw and there was no need because anybody who was reading those portions of Isaiah 53 would absolutely unequivocally say, but of course Christ is the fulfillment. But you have to also consider what's not there. It's good to analyze what's there and what's not there. The obvious is not there. So why am I taking you through this exercise? A number of reasons, and I'll tell you. First of all, as I said, the scripture that he quotes and the judgment upon the people, he came to his own, his own rejected him, which we just looked at something that tells you the preparation for God to offer an offering that would be sufficient, 
that would do the reconciling, atoning, sacrificial work. That would be the culmination of the things we've looked at. Genesis 22, Exodus, the Lord's Passover, Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, Psalm 22, pointing to the, we'll call it dereliction and desolation on the cross, but the work on the cross, the finished work of Christ, all of these pointing in that direction, so crystal clear. And the scriptures that are being quoted, I said this last week, it is highly untenable for one man, if he was just a man, he'd have to be a great magi magician, if someone said he cannot be God, to manipulate thousands of years of prophets from the Old Testament being fulfilled in himself. That preposterous thing that people say, well, this is, this is a made-up scenario, and it didn't really happen, and those people that believe in this are kind of delusional and weak. No, you're actually really smart and intelligent because anybody who really reads this book cover to cover recognizes thousands of years of people were writing. They didn't all write and give the exact same um, details. It's like the, the witnesses I told you at the scene of the accident. They all gave a dimension being unfolded God gave to each messenger, whether he was a prophet by name or not, a foci, a manner, a, a component. So how does one manipulate and fulfill this all? As I said, if Jesus Christ was not God and man, how did a man, who'd have to be the greatest magician of all times, make all of these be fulfilled so that simple men Let's start with Matthew, who was a tax collector. You remember I delivered a message on Matthew telling you, don't paint him, we tend to do this, as some pious character because we know being a tax collector put him at the bottom of the barrel. I want to say something so badly. <laughs> but I'm going to stay out of that. Isn't that what tax collecting is today? Sorry. <laughs> Anyway, I delivered a message on Matthew to give us some clarity and paint a good picture of Matthew, a proper picture of Matthew. So when Matthew is quoting scripture, you may say, well, of course, but Matthew's a Jew. Matthew's would be, he'd be well familiar with the Old Testament. That's correct. But let's just put this in proper perspective. For him to say, this happened, that this might be fulfilled, well, you could say, okay, here it goes. Bear with me, and I don't mean blasphemy. Well, you know, Jesus lucked out because his mom was a virgin, so, you know, he made that one happen. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it, great magic there, right? But it was widely believed at the time that a new era of redemption would come through the Messiah. The only question is if people could believe that Christ was indeed the Messiah. Then you begin to, you almost have to look back at the messages I've delivered over the last few weeks and begin to pull in those pieces. Why, for Abraham, the Lord provided in place of offering his only begotten son, but it gave the picture of God, A, wanting to see complete trust in him, which the son had to have towards the father to carry out the mission, to carry out what he said he came to do, not just die on a cross, but also go into the grave and be raised up specifically as he said. So you've got that dimension there. You've got shadows and types replete through Genesis, but specifically Genesis 22. And the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, why? One time with Christ being crucified there, the next time it will be when he returns. You go to the Lord's Passover and applying the blood which has the death angel passing over, saving the people and leading them out of Egypt's bondage. We have Christ looking at his finished work through the New Testament. 
as our Passover. Christ is referred to as that in Paul's writing. Christ, our Passover, as the blood is applied to our hearts, his shed blood applied to our hearts. No more doorposts, but if there is such a way to understand Christ is the door, the blood was applied to the door, we have to go through the door. If it makes any sense to look at it that way. But all in all, all of these, the Day of Atonement, the covering, the covering of the sins for just one year versus the covering of sins of your lifetime and of my lifetime through his shed blood. All of these give a dimension. And as I said, Isaiah 53 pops the lid off of everything by saying he was bruised and wound for our transgressions. Painting the picture not just of how he would hang in shame, that he would be crucified with criminals, the, the whole unfolding. And that's why I said it's missing in Matthew. But my point, to stay on point, is the things that Matthew quotes, the ideas that one can say were merely fabrications become impossible fabrications. These are fulfillments. And this is not coming out of the mouth of someone who's delusional. This is coming out of the mouth of someone who says it's impossible for men to make up such things that some would say, but there are such discrepancies between the Gospels. This is what gives them their authenticity. This is what makes you look at this and say, verily, this is indeed the story of the Son of God coming to die, his work at the cross, his saving work, which was being ushered in before the eyes of these men, whether they knew it or not at the time, for the whole world, for generations to come. The Passover instituted for generations to come now in a different way, in a new and living way. So the significance of all of this, looking at the crucified Christ, death and resurrection of Christ, which really starts, we'll call the passion uh, portion of Matthew starts at about verse uh, chapter 26 through uh, the end. We're, we're going to go there in a minute. But the importance of what Matthew includes in this case, if you kind of just give uh, a little bit of a highlight beginning in chapter 26, which begins with him saying, Christ saying, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Matthew is drawing our attention probably more than any other writer to the fact that the conspiracy to accomplish what I read to you in the parable out of Matthew 21 is led by the religious people, his own people. And the telling of shed blood will be a theme carried through these verses which you cannot escape. The blood of innocent which takes you back to the Old Testament and the sacrifices that were offered that were perfect. They were innocent and they were perfect. When Judas realizes what he's done. He's essentially now realizing there's no way out of what he's done, recognizing that innocent blood is going to be spilled at the cost of his silver that he received. All the way to Pilate washing his hands and making the comment about essentially washing his hands and being free from worry about this blood that will be shed. But it's interesting that the whole gospel, if you really start looking for those words, you'll find them. And you'll find that Matthew is not only laying a, a trail for us to follow that tells the story, but in such a way that it is unmistakable. Don't try to take away the blood. Don't try to take away the sacrifice. Don't try to take away the application of the blood. The salvation that comes, the forgiveness of sin that comes, the reckons. Don't try and take anything away that was in the Old Testament because Christ, when he is risen, he embodies all of this. He is because he is risen. And it is in Mark's gospel that you'll find the blood of the covenant. I spoke about the blood of the innocent, the blood of the covenant. 
being mentioned in such a way that for those people who were devout Jews who began to follow Christ, they could understand in terms they would understand covenant relationship with God. Why? Because from the very beginning, God said there was to be nothing done from the time that Moses began to lead the people. This actually is before, but, but the time Moses started to lead the people, everything was done by the sprinkling of blood. It was sprinkled upon the congregation, upon the book. It was sprinkled everywhere. So if you think about these elements, the blood of the covenant would be understood by those who were Jews yet following Christ. It would not be understood by a Gentile because covenant meant nothing. That type of a covenant meant nothing. And then ultimately, the blood in Matthew's writing as giving the ability to wash and to cleanse. No pagan, no Gentile could understand this, but a Jew would. A Jew most certainly familiar with the offerings would at least for a year, not for a lifetime. So why is this important? Because the message of the cross out of Matthew has some concepts to it that if you put it all together, you recognize when people begin to talk about the death and resurrection of Christ, you cannot look away from, especially the text that I've used, you cannot ignore the Old Testament shadows and types. And most importantly, you can't, I'm sorry, you can say, I do not believe this story at all and I reject it. There are many out there who do. That didn't happen. This is all a fabrication. And I again, I digress to something to ask the question. Is it possible that this is a conspiracy that was woven during thousands of years for men who didn't know each other over the course of hundreds, and I said thousands of years, to write things that would complete the portraiture, rather than describing an accident scene, complete the portraiture, or the tapestry as I've called it, of who Christ was, what he was coming to do, what his work would be, and ultimately in some places unfulfilled, like the book of Zechariah when it says he will return and when he does, he's going to tell the people, those who look upon him, those who pierced him and will mourn, he's going to tell those people, you're going to come and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Move out of your houses, out of your comfort zone, and offer offerings. I know that makes people kind of crazy because how could Christ return and then demand that people move out of their houses? And that's what the book of Zechariah says. And I'm, I'm of the type because I've come to such a faith after studying this book and still realize that there are elements and dimensions and components that if you turn at a certain angle, you begin to see in a different way instead of just saying with blinders, yes, I've read it, I know it, you know, chapter and verse, I can recite it. How about looking at it through the eyes of one, such as Matthew, who perhaps his suffering servant is the reconciler for the Jews who will accept him, for the Gentiles who will hear. And I said, unlike Luke, whose presentation is more about the compassion of Christ, the acceptance, uh, people are going to hate what I'm going to say, but the acceptance of women in Christ's day, Luke was painting this picture. This is why Luke talks about more about the women followers and the women supporters and the women that were there and naming a lot of the women. The acceptance of women, not tolerance, acceptance. Hashtag acceptance. <laughs> Mark's interest, I may refer to perhaps on festival, I may not get there. And the relevance for people can, as I said, wrap their mind around the verity of this. We're not talking about the King James Bible. We're not talking about whether the elements of the English version are exact. We're not even talking about the Sinaiticus, the Alexandrians, which are the, the oldest extent that we have telling the stories, the passion narratives. 
which take us back to centuries ago. But we're talking about, if you can wrap your mind around this, it becomes really impossible to separate Old and New Testament. It becomes impossible to look at the saving work of Christ and say, okay, I believe he lived and perhaps he died. As I said, no death has ever been so talked about. Can you tell me any death in history that has been more remembered, more talked about, more scrutinized than the death of Jesus Christ? But then, even for non-believers, that probably is an easy thing too. Then there's only one component that remains, and that is the resurrection portion of this. And when you get to that part, after reading through his own, that, his own that conspire, his own disciple that betrays him, that's Judas, and you'll find that same, uh, what I'm referring to in the 26th chapter again, that betrays, went to the priest, so one in his own household, that scripture that says, he that ate bread with me, a scripture there being fulfilled, one of his own, of his own household, of his own people, he goes to the priests. All of this happens during the Passover. And this is why I said it is impossible to have the concept of fabrication, especially, I would just simply ask this. One has to ask then, what is the meaning of the gospel? Don't just simplify it by saying, well, it's the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what is at the heart? The heart, as I read you the parable, that Jesus said, this would happen. And from the beginning, it's Matthew that records three times Jesus saying, foretelling his death for this cause I came. Three times, three different ways. Also, letting his disciples know, through this, what is called the Last Supper, the Passover, the Last Supper, which is in the 26th chapter, when he says, take eat, this is my body. And he says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, if you think about this, he declares himself sufficient as Passover, as Day of Atonement, although it's not declared here, as the act of what would occur on the Day of Atonement, the sprinkling of the blood, the covering, the sufficiency, all of these fulfillments. And remarkably, it's, it, there, it, just, it's, it is being fulfilled from the 21st chapter where it says, and they will kill him. We can say, well, it was the Romans. They crucified him. We've gone through this before. The Romans crucified him. Well, follow the story closely because you know that Pilate first said he found this man was guilty of nothing. But it was his own people combined with Pilate. And a careful reading is quite suggestive because what it says is in the reconciling work, Jesus just didn't die for the Jews. He died for Jew and Gentile, hence why you have the involvement. You can say, yes, but Pilate was the one. He was sent before Pilate after many of these trials. But this is why you've got this connection within Matthew's gospel, probably the most, to show that a new dimension of redemption was made possible. The door was being thrown wide open and no longer just solely to the Jews. In fact, in this case, Matthew's expression is like saying, when he came to his own and they rejected him, God said, okay, now I'm closing the door. But the door will open again, but it will open in a different way through my son. And all can come, anyone who comes, anyone who comes can come. So we have in Matthew's writing a king also being crowned, not just in mockery, but in reality as he is shown as resurrected. Now, if you keep spinning through this, we have the death of, G of Judas, um, Jesus being delivered to Pilate, the death of Judas, and then ultimately in the 28th, I'm sorry, the 27th chapter, what we looked at last week being recorded, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the land until the ninth, 
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. And we talked about this last week um, regarding things that are coming out of the Psalter. This one is out of Psalm 22, which we looked at. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And here we have the ultimate, we'll call it the ultimate proof, otherwise the statement is nonsensical, of the separation of the Son from the Father in the moment that God laid upon him the sin, sins of the world. So why have I been doing this? Because I've been trying, it's almost like building a house and laying a foundation and using those Old Testament tools and putting ourselves in the mindset that up until today there is no New Testament. All we have to go on is what we have in the Old. If you were trying to explain to somebody in that day before the Gospels began to be circulated, how would you have done it? Well, you could tell the story as an eyewitness and say, I was with him. I was there when he was on the mount. I was there when he preached that message in 19-something. <laughs> I heard that message five times already, right? Because he, he told it many times. They recorded it once. There are many things that we could take away from this, but probably the most important thing in taking the old and the new and then putting them together like this is building a solid foundation for solid, basic Christianity and solid theology. When people ask and they're looking for answers, it's not found in one verse simply alone, but through combing the scriptures and recognizing something really glorious. And this is why at the end of this, I walk away almost thinking, I don't know how someone could study. We're not talking about those who just say, oh, you know, I heard about this, but they haven't looked and they're still in ignorance. But if you really begin to study this book from cover to cover, you really run into a very big problem. And the very big problem is you cannot, you have nowhere to go. You're almost, you are, you're backed into a corner. And the corner is this, having to accept or completely reject. There's nothing in between. You either completely accept based on the fact that, as I said, thousands of years before, people were writing of him, giving pieces and components that then he himself, one by one, is fulfilling, of thousands of years of people foretelling, and not only doing that, but also giving, leaving us with more prophecies by telling us he will return. But interestingly enough, as I said, you're painted into a corner. He really did fulfill and become our deliverer, our Passover, our atonement. You put everything you want on it because that's what the scripture speaks of for which I said the Jews are still awaiting their Messiah. They rejected Christ. But we who read and study this, there's something you, as I said, you're backed into a corner and there's nothing in between. And this is why I'm saying to you today, the meaning and message, God is still wanting that message to go and be spread into the nations as long as people will hear, not just necessarily as I'm saying it now, you can say, but I've heard the gospel told, Pastor, and better than you who've told it, and more eloquent than you who have preached it. The responsibility is to keep preaching it, not to try and find something new that you can be fascinated by, but to remind you of the simple faith, very intricate unfolding plan of redemption, the very Christocentric nature of Matthew's writing and telling us about the death and the blood and the most important thing, that he is risen. That power that he was raised up from the dead, that God honored his word to his son, that he said he would do this thing, that makes everything come together for me and say all of this, the whole thing, even the things that are hard for me to wrap my mind around because I cannot and you cannot, as flesh pots know, all the mysteries of God. Make me know God is not only real, I've said this before, but every single sin, every single act, the things that you look upon in your heart with sorrow and you say, I wish there was something to remedy this thing 
the things you want to be forgiven for, the things you need to be forgiven for, the things you need to give forgiveness for, all satisfied through the finished work of Christ. Nothing else to think about except trusting him and, in this case, participating in something that requires people still spreading the word, still wanting to hold up the banner and tell other people out there who have been so buffeted or deluded by life that think that there is no hope for them or this whole thing is a lie. I'm not asking you to go out there and reason with people and win them to Christ. That's not going to happen. Only Christ, through his spirit, does that and brings people. But I'm asking you to be the men and women who are uncommon, who aren't ashamed, past, present, future of your life or of mine, and who recognize the privilege and not be like the children of Israel right until the time of Christ, who, even those who recognize that he was indeed, couldn't break with the tradition. They couldn't go with the idea because that would be leaving all of the concepts of their fathers to join in with a movement that wasn't led by some nutty revolutionist. Well, he was a revolutionist in the sense that he turned the world upside down and inside out because he made it all. But God, whose only begotten son was sent to this earth for you and for me to die and to be everything that the Old Testament declared for the people for a time, he is forever for his people. Now that only, as I said, requires one thing that you and I keep faithing and recognizing that makes us God's people who are loved and cared for. And what I spoke about earlier requires a little thought maybe on treating the responsibility of what God has granted you in your lifetime. The ability to know that out of the thousands, millions of people on the face of the earth, God chose you. You're not an accident. God chose me. I'm not an accident. And God is not concerned about yesterday's mistake or this morning's thought process of blowing off being here or listening or attending somewhere, as I've said. This isn't like here is the only place. I've said to you, find someone that you can listen to and agree with most of the time on most theological issues. But don't make excuses and don't act in disfaith. For what I've just described makes it impossible. I said you're backed into a corner, which either means all of this is true and you're standing in the gap just as those at another time did between the living and the dead, or it's all a lie, we're all delusional and we're gathered here like crazy people every week. And I'm telling you, we're not gathered here as crazy people every week. We may be a little crazy, but not as crazy people as people who know the Lord is risen and that shed blood purchased this blood-bought ban and those that are in the sound of my voice that can hear me purchased, washed, and forgiven that calls for something a little bit more than sitting back in complacency, something to think about. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.